Hello and welcome to Big Ideas for Small Spaces. This series of webinars is brought to you by Gardening the Hudson Valley and I'm your host Marie Iannotti. I hope you've been enjoying the series so far. If you've missed any episodes, you can access them, access them on the website at www.gardeningthehudsonvalley.com. And today we are visiting the FW Vanderbilt Garden Association Incorporated, a dedicated group of volunteers that has been working on the rehabilitation and ongoing care of the formal gardens at the FW Vanderbilt National Historic Site in Hyde Park, New York. With me here are Sue Williams and Suzanne Gillespie. Welcome to you both. I am delighted to be here. I can't think of a better example of a formal Italianate garden. Um, so I'm happy to get a chance to talk with you today about your group's work and the gardens. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, this is, as I said, formal gardens and it's a historic site in the Hudson Valley. Yes, well, thank you very much. We're happy to have this opportunity to talk about um, the Vanderbilt Mansion and the gardens. And we're looking right now at a photograph of the mansion. Uh, Frederick and Louise acquired the property in 1895. And one of the first things they did, um, originally they thought they would enlarge upon the mansion that had already been built by the Langdon family, but then found it was structurally unsound. And so they demolished that building and proceeded to build their own. Uh, one of the interesting things about the property is that Frederick and Louise were the fourth owners and we're really fortunate that everyone that came before them was really interested in horticulture and landscaping design and particularly planting uh, wonderful trees. So Samuel Bard um, was actually the first person to own the property and decide to site his house where the mansion is now. And that was because it was the highest elevation and also had the best views up and down the Hudson. Hmm. We're looking at photographs then of uh, Frederick and Louise. Um, Frederick was probably um, in his early 50s when this was taken. We're not quite sure when the photograph of Louise, it's a very glamorous pose. She was uh, very social. He was a little bit more uh, quiet and uh, with shy. Um, and they made a very good couple because they sort of balanced each other. He was very um, well educated. He had gone to what is currently called Yale University. It was the Sheffield School when he went there. It was the only one of his family to go to college. And um, he was very interested in landscaping, in horticulture, in livestock. Um, he won many prizes at the Dutchess County Fair for his um, entries in flowers and, and um, animals. Uh, Louise was very philanthropic. Uh, she did a lot for the um, families in Hyde Park. He also was philanthropic, but very quiet. Was he hands-on at all? He would um, definitely decide with his gardeners about certain things that they would put in, even though the landscape designers made a plan. They would make a lot of changes. We don't really know whether he dug in the soil, yeah, yeah. but he was very um, instrumental in what varieties of plants were going to be um, so. purchased. And also, I think a lot of the nurseries came to them um, at that time and asked them to trial things. Now, they were not here full time. No, they were generally here in the early spring, sometime in April, and then they would leave again around July 4th. They had other homes. Uh, they also had um, yachts, so and they did a lot of traveling in Europe. And then they would come back again in the fall. They really loved oh, it, being okay. here in the fall. And they were also here at Christmas time. They would close up the mansion and live in what they call the pavilion, which is now the visitor center. And um, they really loved sleigh, sleigh rides and other winter sports. So they were here at that time. Nice spot for that. Uh, the building we're looking at now is called the Tool House. And in Vanderbilt's time, um, they used it for tools on the lower level. And then upstairs, the head gardener had his office. And there's a little balcony there. So he could come out there from time to time. And it would be a great place for him to see what was going on at all times in the gardens. The, this building and the gardener's cottage, um, which is a little bit further to the east, 
were two buildings that were built by the prior owner, the Langdon family. And they were the ones, they're very important because they cited the formal gardens here. The other owners had gardens, but we know they were up closer to the mansion. Hmm. What happened to those? Okay, just well, um, they they just disappeared. Um, we're, we think that he wanted the gardens here for a couple of reasons, Langdon, because it was a destination when people were here socially, especially um, on the weekends, they would take a nice stroll down to the formal garden. So it was a destination and it was a much more open site where they had a lot more sun so they could have more plantings. Okay, this is important. A greenhouse complex was kind of where everything started and revolved around. Yes, and there was um, a great greenhouse that ran between, um, was built between the tool house and the gardener's cottage. It's called the Carnation House, and that was principally what they grew there. Red carnations were one of Vanderbilt's favorite flowers, and they grew a lot. They even sold some carnations from time to time. And then there were two smaller, um, sort of squat, uh, greenhouses on each side of the entrance gate and they were used for palms and other tropical plants and very often they were rotated up through the house uh, to decorate the house but they also used them to uh, donate palms and Easter lilies to the churches uh, in the Hyde Park area and poinsettias to decorate the altars at Christmas time and then the big greenhouse which was formed in the letter H was used for other plants that they would bring into the house and sometimes we think also for starting things that they could then move out into the garden into the um, coal frames that they had and harden them off and then bring them into the planting areas. And we'll see an outline of what the greenhouses look like but we should mention that the greenhouses are no longer in existence. They are no longer there. Um, some of them were damaged um, through weather related incidents and then others were dismantled and sold and there were a few that was just uh, damaged that they were no longer safe they were all glass and so it's too expensive um, for the park service to even think about operating them but and we're getting a glimpse here of the the part the top of the formal gardens the parterre and the bedding plants and we'll talk a little bit more about that later with some better photo more color more colorful photos coming up but. and this is the inside of the uh, carnation house and you can see one of the gardeners there and um, tending to the plants and this was, was great too because it had a door at uh, each end that led directly either into the tool house or into the gardener's cottage so he didn't even have to go outside that's nice these were grown for indoor use for, for display indoor use not for the gardens okay and, and these are the palm, palm houses, houses. And then this was the main greenhouse again, uh, a, a more individual picture of it. And it was used um, very heavily in Vanderbilt's time. And we, we wish we had a greenhouse just mm -hmm. like that. Was it common yes, to have a greenhouse back then? Yes, I think most of the families um, along the Hudson, if they had any kind of property, we know that because they say that Vanderbilt was not the only one to donate things to the church. There were other families who participated in that too. That's nice. The important thing about this site is that this site hosted one of the first greenhouses in Dutchess County through the uh, first owners. Hmm. The Bards had a greenhouse? One of the owners. Okay. Yeah. I think Dr. Hosick, um, he was he was very important in horticulture, and there are some accounts even written by um, noted landscape designers of the time, uh, like Downing, and they pay tribute to the the garden, and they call it more of a conservatory. That's um, yeah, names changed over right. the years. Yeah. So. Okay, we're going to move to some of the structures and the rehab of the structures. Well, after the Vanderbilts uh, passed away. No one really knew what to do with this site. So luckily, FDR purchased the site. But with Depression, World War II, they couldn't maintain the site. So it did fall into disrepair. And this, what was left of this structure, which is known as the North Pergola, being a Pergola meaning open air room, so you'd have a, a ceiling like of a lattice work, so sun could come in. And most features 
features of an Italian garden are open air rooms and water features. And this is still part of the This pergola. is part of the still of the North Pergola, which this is all that is left of the uh, terracotta bench that went around the half circle. Um, and the whale head, which probably would have a palm in it from the palm houses. Now the terracotta bench is still on site and is in uh, storage. Hmm. The tile flooring uh, also fell into disrepair and, and it was eventually restored. So it was bits and pieces when the Park Service took over. It's about all was left. <laughs> <laughs> Again, uh, water features being part of an Italian style, uh, this was the reflecting pool with the um, arbors for grapes and bittersweet. Uh, again, the pool cracked, no one took care of it, uh, pillars fell, the wood rotted, trees overgrew everything. And it, it was quite a challenge for the Park Service to take care of or, or even to start restoring. It's a wonder that they bothered to restore it at some point. It, it just looks so beyond help. I'm, I'm impressed <laughs> well, that they undertook the challenge. What's, what's, what was very lucky is that from the architectural drawings for the buildings and the paths and the walls is still available. They, the Park Service has it in their um, restoration buildings, the actual blueprints for all of this. Great. So putting it back together was easier, you might say, than you think. Well, building it from scratch would have been easy, but <laughs> tearing what was there, yeah. I'm sure it was quite difficult. <laughs> okay, this is one of the things that they are, uh, the estate is most renowned for, it's wonderful rose garden. Again, the, no one was here to take care of it, and the roses just um, succumbed to age, and the Park Service found that it was easiest just to grass in the areas to um, allow for maintenance. This building on this site is the uh, Loja. This is Vanderbilt held tea after she escorted her guests down to the Rose Garden. And again, another water feature known as the Orpheus. Now, the Orpheus fountain um, actually had a frog in place and this was a gift to the Vanderbilts. So in 1914, they put in Orpheus, and that's been on site ever since, and now has been removed for restoration. So Orpheus made it through the grassing over of the Rose Garden, but now finally <laughs> somebody noticed he needed some help himself. That's good. Okay, so here we got a better picture. You can see the overgrown um, shrubbery that was left. Uh, there's a few roses still there, uh, surprisingly. Uh, they did try to keep Orpheus protected, but unfortunately the box fell apart. There were van vandals. It just literally fell apart from age. Um, now hopefully within a year or so, we'll be back to running water. Wow. Okay, a few more of the structures here. The potting shed was attached to the greenhouse. Uh, the small room that juts out to the west was kept for bulbs, pots, other storage. What's interesting in this, it has a massive cellar to this for the coal that heated the greenhouses and the uh, coal frames to the uh, south of this building. The furnace in the tool house heated the palm houses and the carnation house, so it, it just wasn't one furnace. Mm. What's interesting about this building is that in the far end, the northern end, away from us, uh, is a refrigerator unit. Uh, it's just wood and sawdust, and Mr. Vanderbilt would put vegetables, his flowers, and have them shipped to his other houses from here. And a lot of the debris is um, from the pergolas and other structures. Yeah. This is how it was found. Hmm. And when uh, Sue was mentioning about the furnaces too, it's an interesting aside that the gardeners that were assigned to the greenhouses when the winter months, they would work their, their day shift and then they would go home and have dinner. And then later on in the evening, they would come back to uh, put the coal in the furnaces to keep all those greenhouses heated. Yeah, I bet it was a, a round the clock job in the winter, yeah. 
So when the Park Service did come back in, they had to look at what was left, which actually was quite a bit to go on. But before you do any gardening, uh, home gardening, uh, restorations, historic site gardening, is to look at the hardscape, that being the walls, stairs, paths, buildings, and such. And replacing that first is really the key to putting any garden back. You really don't need, want to jump ahead to just throwing in flower beds. Uh, doing uh, It just gets in the way of doing the basics first. Did you get all that brush and well, out you, of you have to clean, you, li you have to make a mess <laughs> to clean, to make another mess. So you have to clean everything out and see what bones you have left in a garden. Mm. Just some of the uh, facade that has fallen away from one of the brick walls. But in doing so, the Park Service was able to see how these were actually constructed. So something Which, good came out of this uh, it, right. <laughs> decomposition. It here. usually does. It usually does. Okay, we're going to start talking about how things turned around, and they did. So in the 1970s, the Park Service um, were given funds to start some of the restoration in the garden. So they started with the brick walls. They probably had to dismantle some of the badly deteriorated ones, but they were able to save the capstones and a lot of the granite tops to the pillars and things. So uh, the biggest problem was they had to uh, recreate the pink mortar that Mr. Vanderbilt used. They tried several different techniques and nothing worked. So then somebody finally came up with a very simple solution of crushing up some of the old bricks putting them into the mortar, and it worked. It matched the old mortar. I was lucky. That they used before. And then they came in and we did all of the um, lattice work over the north pergola. And this is the structure we saw a few earlier, slides back. Okay. And the pillars that were behind the potting shed, those were the pillars, and they moved them back in. Um, this is cypress. And it, did ha it does have to be replaced every so often, but this was the beginning of the beginning. As you can see, none of the paths had been put in yet, but still the beginning. If you remember the other photo, a lot of the pillars were still up. Um, they were too badly gone, so they had to take, remove everything, reset the footings. Where are we now? Is this the this reflecting pool? This is the pool? reflecting pool. And they had to reset the footings to uh, to rebuild the brick pillars and capstones. Now, inside the small brown wooden box inside of there is a statue called uh, Barefoot Kate. Yeah, originally she was uh, purchased by Vanderbilt um, in uh, from an art gallery in Florence, Italy. And uh, she's actually technically, I guess, called an odalesque in art terms, but Vanderbilt's gardeners thought that was really highfalutin. Mm -hmm. So they were the ones that christened her barefoot Kate. But she is Carrara marble and she is a, a dancing or harem girl. She sits on a beautifully detailed little oriental carpet and she is one of the beautiful additions in the garden. We finally let her out of the box, right? Yeah. We know she that building was put in about 1922 because one of the masons signed one of the bricks. Hmm. So again, they came in and put on the cypress lattice work, and now um, we have Concord grape growing on one and bittersweet on the other, but bittersweet is an invasive species in New York State, so you'll probably see grape vines put back on the other. But what's in very interesting about this photo is you can see the outlines of the old gardens for the perennial area and this area would have been known as the uh, pool garden area so it was easy to find where the actual garden outlines you're talking about the worn rectangles the worn towards the rectangles front of the photo. where the weeds are okay. and that's not so much grass um, and that's something people can look at around their own gardens is um, worn areas depressions uh, places where the grass dies quicker than any place else. Mm. And 10 to 1, there were gardens in those areas. 
And you said that they are growing Concord grapes now. I assume that wasn't what uh, the Vanderbilts were growing, but yeah, I believe no. it was Concord grapes. Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they do well in this area. Yeah, yeah. And actually, we've had them one year. They grew so well, and they weren't plagued by birds or mold mm -hmm. or anything else. And we made grape jam. Wow. Don't let Welch just find out. The only trouble with the pool is at the um, area where Barefoot Kate is, it's about six feet deep and about uh, three feet deep at the other end. And that is well beyond the safety requirements in New York <laughs> State. So to overcome this, we thought of many things to do, but the best thing we came up with was this decking. Uh, it's made of specially treated wood, so nothing is poisonous to the plants or to animals drinking out of it or people. And our local, one of our local lumber stores came up with the um, computer program. And we have uh, quite a few very good handyman on our volunteer staff, and they built it. So this is decking that goes under the water. This and is under the water. Well, it's so the, the level of the pool is actually only 18 inches deep. Hmm. That's a lot of work, but it's very clever. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the unfortunate thing is you can see the grate the rack when you fill it up. So we contacted a fellow in New Jersey, um, James Lowry from Saddle, Saddle River, uh, Waterford Gardens, and he came, told us to buy pie lamb dye. It's a black vegetable dye. And what is quite interesting is that it lays on the top of the water. So you can scoop a bucket of water out and it's absolutely clear. Hmm. And this hides the rack it reflects Kate nicely, and um, it gives an illusion of depth, which scares people, and they stay away from the edge. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, but homeowners can do this too. They don't. They don't. They have a shallow pool. They want it to look a little deeper. You put in um, a dye, and people can't tell how deep it is. And does it block the sun and uh, the algae growth it at all? It blocks the sun to a point. You'll still get um, some algae. There's two types of algae, slick algae, which everybody slips on when they go near their pool, or string algae, yeah. which is like felt. When you, when you pull it out, it comes out in big, large clumps, and it's like hair. And the, the algae that you don't want is the string algae. That will clog up filters. S slick algae really doesn't do anything to them. filters or plants or pools. It, do, it doesn't um, destroy the pool. So this keeps the string algae down. Oh, that's great. Okay, we're going to move to the beginnings of the formal gardens, it looks. Yes, um, well, once the Park Service was done with the hardscaping, um, they really had run out of those funds that they had been given. So what they thought best to do to keep down the weeds and preserve some of the outline was just to grass everything in. So we're looking at each of the areas here and it shows both the annuals, the reflecting pool garden and the uh, rose garden are just simply grassed in. But it, it served the purpose and it did keep down the weeds. But not for long. <laughs> so what happened with this new era? Well, in the new era, uh, three Hyde Park ladies were actually the uh, people who got the ball rolling, and um, Marion Asher, Louise Martin, and Marty Stewart. And they went to the Park Service with an idea that they could start a volunteer group that would help to bring back the actual garden beds. And they were convincing, and uh, they were assigned to work with the horticulturist that was there at the time, Ron Galente. And the, we had the plan, um, as we said before, the archives are really full of great drawings. It's a natural resource to turn to, to see what was going on in the past. And they had the complete plan for the garden, and that's what we're working from. And we're actually charged by the National Park Service to keep the gardens um, as they looked in the 1930s. Because Vanderbilt had a long time span, and the gardens underwent lots of different design changes, but they felt that that would be the best period, and so that's what we follow. And keep it cohesive rather than jumping around a little bit here, yes. a little bit there. Mm -hmm. So in this uh, site plan, we can uh, really see the H-shaped um, greenhouse up in the upper right corner, and are those the palm houses next to it? Mm -hmm. And then below is the main greenhouse? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the 
volunteer group was charged with actual physical labor of replanting everything. Mm -hmm. yes. The Park Service um, told us to take 1984 as a year to organize, uh, become incorporated, uh, figure out what to do, lay the plans, require a mission statement. So in 1985, they said we were ready to plant the annuals. Uh, the gentleman is marking the beds, uh, straight little lines with our little gadget for planting. Um, there's about three to 5,000 annuals mm -hmm. put in. By and, hand. <laughs> by hand, <laughs> it takes a few days. Uh, there are three annual plans for the two parterres. Um, Mr. Alex Knaus was, was one of the workers at one time, and he drew them out for us, so we actually don't have to think too much on replanting. Do you rotate between the three? Or you yeah, we, we do. We, we do do that. On. They were mainly uh, petunias, begonias, heliotrope, lantana, Marigolds. Marigolds. Uh, so zinnias. Zinnias. So with the Park Services horticulture help, we 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 come up with some plant, nice plants for okay. this. And these are the the, the parterre, the that garden that you see when you first enter the formal gardens, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, the boards that the ladies are using are actually marked um, with lines. So you just lay the board down, find the line that the first plant starts on and just follow the lines um, to plant. It, it goes quite quickly. And later on, they'll be fertilized, and then the beds will be mulched. And in the fall, they'll be mulched again with shredded leaves and tilled in for the next year. OK, so that's if you want a formal garden, you would follow these lines. This is not necessarily the yeah. kind of a random this is cottage just these garden. These beds this is very are very particular. large, yeah. and it just helps keep everybody in order. Uh, but it's it's still a, a good procedure for even the homeowner to to till, mulch, fertilize. People usually have um, gardening backwards. The real start to gardening is in the fall when mm -hmm. you compost the beds and till it in because that compost takes up to four months to become available for the plants to use as nutrients. So gardening actually begins in the fall, then you plan what you want to plant all during the winter, and then in the spring you can go out and buy it. Sounds like a plan. Here's the Here's fruits the, of your efforts. Here's the finished item. And you can really see the outline of the shapes. Um, they had hearts and little boots and crescents, fleur de -lis. Mm -hmm. and when you shoot the picture from one of the higher terraces looking down here, you, then you really see the outlines very distinctly. Oops. In 86, we were given permission to start the perennial garden. Uh, the area the volunteers are in at the moment is called the uh, cherry walk. There are cherry trees on the upper um, level from this. And uh, oh, about 3,000 perennials, I believe. Um, there's about 3,000 perennials, and Park Service helped set out the plants, and we again went and put them in. And there's, uh, I mean, some of them did not make it. We had to come across to, for a few different plants, finally. But some of the ones that really do stand out are the Thermopsis or Carolina Lupin, or Lupine, however you wish to, uh, the Dianthus, there are small, um, mums and irises, Siberian iris, bearded iris. Mm -hmm. Now, which garden do you think takes the most maintenance, the annual bedding or the perennials? We won't even discuss the roses just yet. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the perennials. Perennials, I would say. Once annuals are in, they're mm -hmm. on their own, and mm -hmm. all you do is pluck weeds. Okay. Right. These, deadhead if you need to. And, yeah, these but are, these do require a lot of um, close weeding. Um, dividing. Really, dividing, yeah. So. Right, deadheading also. Yeah. Do you do any staking? Some of them, yes. Balloon flowers require mm -hmm. staking. Mm -hmm. Yes. And also, there's some very lovely um, fall. You know, the sedum, autumn joy mm -hmm. is really beautiful in the fall. So there's something for every season. And these are some of the plants you were just um, 
mentioning were good for the uh, mm -hmm. the tall yellow or the Carolina lupin, the blue or the the darker blue, um, probably as cat mint. You, know, you can just barely see some peonies and iris. Mm -hmm. uh, Foxglove. I think uh, one of the smaller geraniums too. Mm -hmm. um, very low growing geranium in there. Pink you know, dianthus. Do you know about what time of year this is? Let's say that must be um, late May, mm -hmm. early June. June sometime. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to talk about the rose garden. <laughs> so in 87, 88, uh, we had gained enough experience where we went to the next level, which actually we went down a level from the perennial garden. Um, two parterres to this garden, upper rose garden and the lower rose garden. Um, Mr. Vanderbilt did actually mix perennials and annuals in with his roses, not actually in, in separate beds from roses. Hmm. Uh, so the Park Service helped us cut out the, the beds. Um, they tilled, did all the good stuff, checked the soil for pH, which is for roses runs around 6.3, 6.5. And then um, we needed to, of course, purchase these roses. Now this rose garden can accommodate about 1,400 hybrid tea roses. Mm -hmm. uh, we were going to purchase them. We put out a, uh, a campaign. People would donate so much money, and we would purchase the rose bushes through this money. In doing so, uh, Jackson and Perkins came across and said, we will donate the roses to you. Wow. So that, that was a big boon for us. It, it also gave us uh, funds in case we had to uh, something go wrong and we lost an awful lot of roses mm. at this one time which we never did but we uh, we, we we did it <laughs> okay let's see we took uh, a, another day with all of our volunteers we mr galenti the park service uh marked out all the beds for us uh, where to plant each rose and I think it took maybe three days, but we put them all in. All hybrid teas, too. All huh? hybrid teas. Okay. There they and are. As you can see, this center bed has over 40 to 50 hybrid teas in it. It's a lot of plants. Uh, because the areas are so big, and we are a volunteer with limited funds, we went and bought bulk sawdust for mulch. Hmm. And you really. There's two states of mind whether you should mulch roses or not. I, I really don't like mulching roses, but there's two thoughts on this. But this sawdust is extremely clean. It's mostly hardwoods. It's from a local lumber supply. And they sell a lot to stables in the area, so we knew it was a good product to use. We never had a trouble with it caking or uh, holding, withholding nitrogen in the soil. And it, it worked very well. Good to know. And here we are in all its glory. You can barely yeah, we, see the mulch. <laughs> right. Now, hybrid teas, unfortunately, um, they have a short lifespan. Uh, the longest lifespan we had for one was called Milestone. And that was alive for quite a few years, at least up to eight to 10 years. Most of the other hybrid teas died out between one and five. And that is just a natural thing. It's mm -hmm. not anything you've done or any reason you bought the wrong plant. It's just roses don't have a long lifespan. And if a homeowner wanted to really put in a rose garden, they needed to really research which roses they pick. Hybrid tea roses were actually uh, hybridized to grow in greenhouses for cut flowers, which were sent to the urban areas. So they were Unless you lived in the south, they really were not meant to be in a northern garden. Even if you fuss over them? And <laughs> no, no, you can fuss all you want. They're just going to poke you back. Um, they just have, they're very, very temperamental. Uh, they don't mature until age three. So those first three years, it's very easy to lose them. And people get very discouraged. I would. Uh, <laughs> you get very discouraged. So. I always tell people buy, if you're going to buy a rose and you're going to pay very good money for this, 
use it as a focal point. Uh, focal point being what draws your eye into the garden. Kate, barefoot Kate, draws your eye into the perennial garden. Orpheus draws your eye into the rose garden. So if you buy a very good rose, um, either the Rugosas or Explorers or the fairy tale roses, as your focal point, and then go to the your local department stores, lumber stores, buy cheap roses. And they're not actually cheap, I'm going because usually they're like less than five dollars a rose. What it, what they are is that they are roses that the patent has gone off of. Hmm. So anybody can hybridize them now. So you can get award winners, but they may not last. So buy those. Don't spend $30 on 10, 15 roses when you might lose them. And use them as annuals. Okay. <laughs> but is that what you did with the rose garden? <laughs> we'll talk about that yeah. in a bit. <laughs> so there were quite a few more uh, restoration efforts along the way here. Well, one of those um, involved bringing electricity um, to the lower parts of the garden. Um, Vanderbilt had had his own powerhouse and then afterwards then and that provided the power for not only the garden area but the mansion as well but then um, when the park service took over there was electricity up at the mansion put in but um, and at the tool house because that was also used as a residence early on for park service employees but we needed to have power for the lower part of the garden um, the tool house was fine, but the uh, potting shed had absolutely no light in it, and there was no way that we could run an irrigation system or an aerator in the reflecting pool. So one of our members um, had a contact at Central Hudson and asked them if they might be willing to help us out, and so they actually donated their services, and they worked with us and with the National Park Service and laid the lines mm. so that we would have electricity to power those areas of the garden. Nice. Now, you're saying the Vanderbilts did have electricity, they just powered it off of the... the they had a small, small uh, pump, pump house, house on the uh. Crum Elbow Creek, and it um, powered the house, and it also powered the water, pushed the water up to the house, and then gravity fed down through the gardens back to the Crum Elbow Creek. Nice. Off the grid. Very much. <laughs> In 2004, we were doing some research on Boy Dolphin. Boy Dolphin is for, from the Langdon era. He is marble, and he has withstood the test of time as far as acid rain. And he is the first thing you actually see when you come down the steps. That is the main entrance into the garden from the path from the mansion. And he was grassed in. The Park Service uh, grassed him in, filled him with soil, and grassed it over. So, Did he remain? On, like, was the statue sitting there on yes, the lawn? Yes, the statue was sitting on, on a small patch okay. of lawn. And it was always thought, oh, this would be so nice to get running again. So looking at some photos, we saw some valve covers in the front. I, I asked permission to dig a little bit, and we found them. So after that, I asked permission, can we dig out some dirt? And we did. And as we were doing this um, with the Park Service, um, we found the walls to the pool were still intact. Huh. The drain was intact. The piping was intact. So we, uh, after we cleared out all the soil, uh, we hooked a hose up to the local irrigation and to the um, piping for the statue. And lo and behold, the water spouted out of the little fishy mouth. Uh, mm -hmm. So after 60 years of not running, the way was clear to restore this, this fountain. Uh, so all we ne he needed to do was to resurface the bowl. We ran electricity from the tool house, hooked into a pump, and plugged him in, and That's now fantastic. he runs, and uh, his great, great entrance focal point for the garden. Yeah, how lucky that it all fell into well, place. Well, somebody thought when they put him to bed. That's not the usual case, is it? <laughs> and then one of the other uh, projects we embarked on was um, putting in new cherry trees. Um, the uh, Garden Association had done that fairly early on, and the trees had lasted for a while. And then they developed something called canker. 
and we realized that we were going to have to replace them. And so um, we did with um, a prunus that the variety is called Okama. And they're a sort of horizontal spreading format to the tree. And that's really very graceful along the upper part of the cherry walk. And they bloom generally, depending upon what kind of a winter we've had, they generally bloom um, in early May. And we have lots of visitors who come. Mm. It's almost like our own little mini cherry blossom <laughs> festival. When they're out, we have lots of people coming to visit and, and to sit there and paint. Oh, really? Yes. Nice. Did the, now, these line, they way into the perennial garden? Is that what you yeah, said? Yeah, this is the, the cherry walk. Um, okay. So this is the stone wall along here, and the cherry trees are... On, on the upper part of that. Nice. Rose gardens, as I said before, roses don't last. So about every 10 years, you will have to replace roses. We are into our third replanting now, and we discovered the soil was lacking in nutrients, and it, it was quite hard. There was a hard pan. Um, and that is just from watering so much. We came to the conclusion that a lot of the problems with the soil came from the irrigation system, which ran a uh, liquid fertilizer uh, reservoir. So you were always pumping this into the soil. And liquid fertilizers are high in salts. And that will actually kill off beneficial organisms in the soil and nasty organisms will take over. So that is why you have more diseases and funguses and viruses um, and unhealthy soil. So instead of just loading this up with compost, which we did do, but we also used uh, cover crops for green manure. And hmm. at before they flower, because these are mustards and rye. And That's what we're seeing here? Yes. You want to cut them down and till them in. And we did this for a couple of years. And the soil, um, within two years, has changed dramatically. We okay. actually have earthworms back. And we're in the process of now, this year, replanting this whole area. And with another 14,000 plants? Well, we've uh, with the Park Service, um, we've decided to lower the number of plants to around 300 but we're buying uh, rugosas, explorer shrub, other shrubs, uh, hybrid perpetual shrubs, um, fairy tale shrubs. Um, they grow quite large, like three to four feet or four by four feet. So we're maybe taking out, but we're not losing volume. Mm. Uh, some of the plants we are going to be getting are uh, caramella fairy tales, um, elegant fairy tales. Do I have photos of those here? Yes, you do. Through here. Um, the pink is country dancer. Uh, the yellowish is uh, prairie harvest. Oh, are these repeat bloomers? These are will be all repeat bloomers. Oh, that's nice. And the, their first bloom and uh, <laughs> golden fairy tale. The first bloom on these roses lasts months, up to a month or more. So. There'll be less pruning, less mm -hmm. deadheading, because once they bloom, you can go through and deadhead the entire garden, and you'll get another bloom in September. So you're not always down there b removing dead roses like you are with hybrid teas. And do they require any special winter care? These are zone three roses. Um, all roses have a zone. Many roses in the nurseries are zone five and six. And if you are in an area which is zone three, and um, it's very easy to find on our web anymore where it's the zone you live in, um, it's best to buy uh, like the explorers out of Canada. And they just require less care, less uh, winter coverage, uh, less pruning, less watering. They get less dye back, I assume. Yeah. Pompanella is the pink one. That is that has we had a horrible winter, of course, this year, like almost everyone. <laughs> and this has died back very little. And the white one being Henry Hudson uh, has di not died back at all. So uh, they're doing very well, especially with the winter we had. And the best, actually, the best winter protection you can have is three feet of snow on top. Mm -hmm. It's the uh, dry 
freezing air mm -hmm. that does the most damage. And the freezing and thawing. And thawing. Oh, the freezing and thawing, yeah. yeah. But snow so. is the best. I'm so glad we could oblige with three feet of snow this year. Well, the yeah. smaller the particle, the most, the better the, the protection. So you don't never want nuggets, you never want stone. Even sawdust is great. Smaller particle size, the better the... Why is that? You know? It's just, it's it's like insulation. It's just, uh, and you never want to use these styrofoam rose cones. They, they blow everywhere. Okay. <laughs> and the notice well, the colors of the roses there too, I think, is uh, all that lovely pastel palette. And that was something the Olmstead report that was done on the garden said, you know, you can change from the hybrid teas to other roses. We understand the need for doing that, you know, because of um, the fact that you, if you have, can have the kind of care, uh, level of care for hybrid teas, but also they said, if, as long as you keep the color scheme, and that's what we've done. There's lots of creams and pinks and a few reds. and Because you have to remember, Mr. Vanderbilt wasn't here during the summer months. He wasn't here that often. And this perennial and annual and rose garden were really springtime gardens. Mm -hmm. So we've actually converted them a little more to an all season garden that's great and so, also you know 1400 rose bushes is a lot for a volunteer group to have to take yeah. care of so nothing lost and then the last uh, piece sort of in this uh, rose garden area was to do something about the uh, pool there and it had not had ongoing maintenance for quite a long time. As Sue mentioned before, the Orpheus statue had really been so deteriorated that for safety reasons, the Park Service had actually removed it and taken it down to the coach house. But last year, um, they did receive some money that they could embark on a restoration for us of this pool area. And there's a company called Historic Preservation Training Center. And they're actually an affiliate of the National Park Service. And they brought them in to um, work on the pool. And first of all, they took off the coping stones, the stones that are on top of the pool, and laid them aside. And then they could go into the basin and actually cut and chip away all of the loose material there and fill in the cracks. And then after that, um, they put on an epoxy uh, protector. And then after that, they painted it. Now, it's pretty white right now, and we know that there is going to be uh, more work done on it. There will be another layer of paint that will be put on. They also made connections there for um, aeration and for the uh, for the fountain actually to be running and the plan is that the rest of the work will be done hopefully this year or early the following year and then a replica of Orpheus will be put back in place and so he will be, again be the focal point of the Rose Garden. The Rose Garden will be all back together again. Another main attraction for the site. Here we go. Yeah this shows um, one of the um, points in the restoration. The coping stones are back. They've been realigned. It's been made a perfect circle. And the other stanchion in the middle is where we will mount the statue of Orpheus. But it remains to have one more paint job. And this same company um, had been known by the Park Service uh, for quite some time. And they actually brought them in two years ago, I think, uh, when we realized that the deterioration of the North Pergola roof, it had lasted for a long time when you think about it from the 70s, but now it needed to be replaced. And so that company um, went to the original plans. We have those, as we said, in the archives. And it involved finding enough cypress wood some of these have to be done in one piece, and they really needed to look, they had quite a search to find them, and they actually went to a company that brings them up from the bottom of a lake in Florida, and it's business. And so they contracted with them for the lengths that they needed, and then they were able to bring them up and ship them up from Florida, and then they could start actual work on the redesign. It's amazing what you can find. There's there's an answer to everything. everything. <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit about your group's activities okay. in, at the estate here. Well, um, a lot of people think that we uh, receive funding from the National Park Service, and we don't most of the time receive actual cash. We will sometimes get something in kind, like if they were 
uh, contracting to get mulch for all of the properties, then we might benefit in that way. But we really need to raise all of our own money to buy the plants and to buy the equipment that we need. Uh, so we have a number of fundraising activities, and this is sort of a quasi-fundraiser in a sense because it's a greeter program. And what we really wanted to do on the weekends was have a few of our members be sitting right inside the gates to the garden to welcome people and give them some information about the garden. We have a self-guided tour brochure that they can pick up. We usually have a little listing of all the other um, activities that we're going to have for the season so that people will know when we're having our tea, when we're having our plant sale. And um, then they just they talk with visitors. And we've had people from all over the world. And once they see the gardens, um, many of them come back up. We have a donation box there. And many people say, we really appreciate the work you do, and we'd like to show our appreciation. And so they, they give it. Actually, one year we were we raised through the Greeter program well over $2,000. Wow. it's a lot of visitors. Yes. <laughs> We also keep track of the visitors because the Park Service likes to know that, and it's beneficial to them, I think, in uh, getting additional funding from the government. That makes sense. And then we also started an interpreter program. There, there are interpreters who take people through the mansion and explain to them about the Vanderbilt history. We wanted to do the same for the gardens and also to answer questions about what plants were there and suggestions about different ways you can handle things like your problems. We uh, don't use chemicals in the garden and so we have our own little mix for things like that where we spray. Combination of uh, dishwasher detergent and salt mm -hmm. and um, we, we have had some really good luck with using these natural means which the homeowner can do in their own garden too. You talk about that on you giving tours, or yes, people we ask do. You how people you do ask us that because they very often. I mean, despite the fact that we spray, you have to do it repetitively after mm -hmm. a rain for the deer will come up and browse again. So um, we can tell them this is how you do it, and it, it can be successful, but you have to keep on it. So we talk to them. We bring them on the same route that Mrs. Vanderbilt use when she brought her visitors to the garden and then we end up in the uh, Rose Garden which is where she always served refreshments and we've had some people say and where are the refreshments? <laughs> Another one of our big, actually our main fundraiser for many years um, is the plant sale. And we have it every year so people will know um, every Memorial Day we'll be there in front of the mansion, well, near, nearer to the parking area with our plants. And what we do is um, the plants that we know will winter over well when they sort of outgrow their bounds and need dividing. That's what we do. And then we pop them up and we put them in the old coal frames that the Vanderbilts used. And then it, uh, just before the, it, we really leave the garden for the end of the season in um, early November, we cut back the grasses and we use those dried grasses to um, insulate all of the plants that we have there in the beds. And then in the spring, we'll divide some of the things that don't winter over well, like Japanese anemones we found um, don't winter over well. So that's one of the varieties we'll do in the spring. And uh, then we pop them up and we have a picture here of one of our volunteers uh, arranging the plants um, in uh, flats. And we're fortunate that we have one of our employees, one of our employees, she may think she's sometimes an employee, she puts in so much time, uh, Phyllis Delorme's husband has a flatbed truck for his business. And he brings it down to the garden and we can load so many plants onto that. And then he drives them up and then we unload them outside of the parking area. And that's where we sell our plants. I think we have a shot of that. I think I've gotten them out of order here, so let me see. There we go. There we go. Yeah. So we set up a little tent um, and we have the cashier under the tent. We also have a table with some reference books if people want to look up anything. And we have, of course, our people there. Um, we divide the plants into sun and shade areas and um, by variety. And we have photographs by each variety so that people know what they look like and has some factual information about what's the bloom time, what do they require in terms of the soil and watering. 
and we have a very successful plant raising plant sale here. And this is open to the public, right? They just have and to it's show open up. to the public, um, and it's we have held. people waiting in line to come on day one. It's held on the same weekend every year? Memorial Day weekend, okay. Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And we'll be there this Memorial Day with lots of plants. Hope you got good weather for it. <laughs> oh, well, they come in the rain. I'm sure they do. <laughs> I heard one time. They come in the rain. And I go back to this other slide that I slipped Well, in this is one of our newest fundraisers. Um, we decided that um, an elegant tea would be a very good activity to have with these formal gardens. And we had it for the first time last year. Last year was also our 30th anniversary for the Garden Association. And we didn't want to have those two events too close to each other. So we had one in June, that was the tea, and then the um, anniversary celebration in the fall. But this year we decided um, the annuals will be really peak, peak um, in early September probably before that, but it'll last into early September. And we decided we would move the tea to September. So it will be the first Sunday after Labor Day weekend, which is the 13th. And we had um, beautiful um, table settings. We did it up very elegantly, tablecloths, napkins. We had wonderful um, tea refreshments like scones and madeleines and little tea sandwiches and we had a wonderful speaker it was margaret laffin who's one of the national park service interpreters and she had done a lot of research on her own family tree and then when she finished that she decided she'd also look into louise and frederick's but particularly louise because we knew more about frederick than we did of louise and one of the things that we had always been told was that louise was 12 years older than Frederick. But in her research, she found out that that was not so. And so she entitled her talk, Mrs. Vanderbilt lied about her age <laughs> and the National Park Service got it wrong too. Turns out she was really only about 14 months older than Frederick, but their marriage um, was not publicly acknowledged because she was also a divorcee. And at that point in time, uh -huh. it was not a, a very much socially approved. At least he didn't have to give up his throne, though, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was one of the lesser Vanderbilts. Uh, the first son received the bulk of the funds of the family fortune. He received uh, whatever the girls got, which was ten million cool. each. Yeah. So he wasn't one of the really rich Vanderbilts. Yes, but but <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was rich enough. Uh, so he, he was, if you weren't the first, you were considered yeah. down there with the... But he was the best businessman yes. of the yes. whole clan because he was the only one that ended up with more money. He was uh, like, uh, I don't know, 70 million, something like that. Good for when him he, at the last laugh. Yes, yeah. he did. <laughs> well, you know, did. Uh, education with these families, it, it was frowned upon. Mm. If you wanted to go to college, you, it was very frowned upon mm. that they would actually send you away so you did not go to college. Yeah. So uh, being mm -hmm. down with the daughters actually helped him. He was able to go to college. Yeah. And well, actually, I mean, his his marriage, the, the father was very much against the marriage and almost was going to disinherit him. Ooh. And so it was uh, his younger sister who was the father's favorite that sort of pleaded for him. And, uh -huh. and he never forgot that. And she's the one who gave him the statue of Orpheus. <laughs> and she also, she and her husband owned Shelburne Farms in Vermont. Uh -huh. And they came upon some hard times. And so Frederick never forgot what she did. And he financed them for many years. Wow. Things you don't know about. That's right. OK, so. As, as we said, uh, this was a springtime garden, and we have pushed it to the four seasons. And as a homeowner, and he was a homeowner, this was his home, he actually had um, winter architectural sites and using trees and, and the statuary and even the brick, the uh, rock wall which would draw you into the winter scape here. But even a homeowner, uh, there's many shrubs that are used for winter landscaping. And 
people still come in the winter. They come over. You can see their little footprints all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, we do drain the ponds and the pools. We have to. We have to. So we usually put a, a, a safety net around them so no one jumps in. But uh, so so this is this is the end of what we do, and we'll start again in the spring. Looks so restful. But I'm glad it's over. <laughs> I want to thank both of you, Sue and Suzanne, so very much for uh, coming and talking to us today. Thank this you. is thank such you. a great um, overview for homeowners, not just of the estate, which I hope you'll all come and visit, but also for anybody who finds themselves buying a uh, less than prime garden that they want to bring back to its former glory. So I thank all of you who have been listening today. If you'd like uh, more information about visiting the gardens at the FW Vanderbilt National Historic Site, you can find them on the web at the address here, www.vanderbiltgarden.org. Um, and I thank you so much for watching. Remember, if you missed any episodes, you can catch them all on the Gardening the Hudson Valley website, uh, www.gardeningthehudsonvalley.com. I hope you're picking up some great ideas for your garden, and we will see you next time.